Okay, so um, what I wanted to do today is to do a little bit of um, um, parallel programming. Um, so let's see what kind of programs we can write. Okay. Okay, so I prepared a little bit of something here, which is um, an implementation of the binary natural numbers and a bunch of functions on them. Okay, um, so what do we have here? Oh, one thing I should notice is that um, I used mode declarations um, in order to track as a kind of debugging device to make sure everything will stay well moded. Then we have uh, increment, and I think we talked about these already or we wrote some of them. Um, we have decrement. So it's very tempting to try to use the increment as a decrement operation, right? Because if you give it the second argument, it should decrement it for you. But unfortunately, I ran into trouble here, okay, to use increment as decrement. Um, so can anybody guess what the problem is? Yeah? I'm not sure about the implementation of the decrement. How about the decrement applied to zero? Right, so decrement applied to zero would be an increment with epsilon in the second position, right? That fails. And we want that to fail because we want epsilon not to have a predecessor. So the problem is non determinism. So the problem is that if you give it the number one, okay, in the second argument, which is the digit epsilon followed by one, okay? Then this clause applies, it gives you zero. And the second clause also applies and it gives you essentially epsilon followed by bit zero, right? So what we're dealing with here with these binary representations, they are not unique because you can add as many leading zeros as you want, okay? And so the problem is now if you use increment somewhere else in a situation where it could fail, and there's many situations like this where you have to backtrack, then I'll give you a second solution, right, um, for in the same query. And then, um, you know, this kind of thing snowballs. So these backward chaining predicates. In the forward chaining, we said, at some point, we said, well, there's multiple ways of doing this, and we don't really care because one rule will fire, and we commit to it, and we get the result, okay? But in backward chaining, it's not like that. In backward chaining, if we fail during search, we backtrack, right, and we try to find another solution. So if there's multiple clauses that apply, Right? We actually have multiple solutions, and that's actually very bad if you want to compose it into other pieces of a program. Okay. So the modes work out. Right? If you have the second argument, the first one is determined, just like if you have the first, the second one is determined, but not the determinism. So there really should be more, more things that we can check of these things instead of just saying, okay, increment takes a positive and a negative, or it takes, I mean, second argument is input versus output. We might also want to check it always gives you a unique output. If you had been able to say that, then it would have, would have gotten a, an error on the increment predicate. Okay. So in 12, um, in the 12 implementation, which is a similar logic programming semantics, you can request that certain things be unique and, and the system will check it for you. Okay. But in this implementation, CLF, it doesn't. Okay. Um, so I had to find these things out the hard way. Okay. Um, so therefore, we have a separate decrement where this uh, problem is avoided. Okay, so that's a decrement operation. Then we have the plus, which we actually did before. Then we have a lesser equal, okay. Um, okay. And then I have a bunch of test cases which I just edited out of this file. And we also have less than. Okay, and the reason I want to do that is because I want to next program um, some simple things which can be done in parallel. So the first thing I want to do is um, 
uh, a parallel maximum operation on a list of natural numbers. Okay. So um, we start with a list. It doesn't have to be a list. It could be a tree, but I don't think it matters much. So we'll just start with a list. Okay. So we have um, list as a type. Nil is a list. And cons takes a natural number and a list and gives us a list. Except that because everything is linear, we might as well make these things linear. Okay, so this is something um, I think I haven't talked about explicitly, but what happens is when you have a logical framework or some kind of a logic, then all the rules and all your representations are biased to the weakest structural properties that you have. So in linear logic, all the functions are naturally linear, and you have to separate out the ones that are unrestricted, and you have a special elimination suddenly, which is not function application, but it's one kind of lead construct. If you do ordered logic, because orders is the weakest one, right, then you have this special modality to get into the linear case, like the mobility. Okay? So, and all your logical connectors are focused on the ordered implications. Okay? So um, there are other ways to constructing logics, okay? but usually what happens is that they lead to a lot of redundancy. So what you could do is you could take linear logic and ordered logic and combine them into one, maintaining all the connectors rather than having a modality that goes in between the two. Okay? Um, but that kind of sort of snowballs, and eventually if you also add the unrestricted logic, then you have like, I don't know, seven forms of conjunction. Okay? You have, you know, ten forms of implication. Okay? And they all exist together with, you still need modalities to get back and forth between these different logics. So what we like to do is we like to bias it in terms of the, the, the structurally simplest one, and build the other ones on top of that with simple modalities. But um, I don't think we have a lot of empirical evidence that that's really the right way to do it, because there's other ways to do it. And Rob and I have had many discussions about these things. Um, but that's the way that they're constructed right now. OK. Um, OK. So um, all right. So now we want to, um, uh, let's see, what could we do first? Um, OK, first thing we could do is just, uh, um, okay, let me see. Um, how do I start? <clears throat> okay, so I want to, the kind of algorithm I want to implement, okay, is you can picture it like this. So we have a list of elements, um, okay, x0, um, xn. And I want to be able to take any two elements, wherever they are, it doesn't matter what they are, um, and take the maximum of the two. And then here I have the maximum of x0 and x2 at this node. And I can take a maximum here of two nodes and here of two nodes. Then I can take one here um, and maybe one here. Okay. And at the end, I want to be with just one thing, which is the maximum of all of these. right? So any, any operation, maximum operation between these two gives me this one. Okay. And once I have consumed all the things that are there, then I should be left with just the maximum element at the bottom. Okay, very simple parallel algorithm. It's parallel because you can do a lot of these independently. Okay. Um, because um, you know, taking the maximum of these two, maximum of these two can happen at the same time. Okay. And then once we have programmed this, we want to examine and looking at the proof term to see if we can identify where the parallelism is. Um, and uh, take a look at that. Okay, so the way we have to do this is if we're, I'm using lists as the interface so we can actually tr try our program. So we're giving you a list of numbers. We load it into the linear context. Okay, then we apply our parallel max, and then we have to read it out of the. We have to read the maximal number out of the context. Okay, do you get the overall structure we're trying to do? Okay, so the first thing we need is a load predicate. Um, Okay, so load takes um, a list, um, and uh, okay, so we have to think about um, what we want to return at the end. Um, so let's uh, let's leave this open for now. Let's just do, write the load predicate itself. So if you want to load nil, okay. So basically, when we're loading nil, we should be done, right? There's nothing more to put into the context. When we're loading a cons, to load a cons of a number n 
and a list uh, of containing more numbers. Okay. Um, okay. So this is a backward chaining logic program because we iterate over the list. Okay. So we say this is true if. And now, in order to get something into the context of the backward chaining phase, you have to have a sub goal which itself is an implication. To execute that, you'll take the left hand side of that and you put it into the context. Okay. So we put into the context the element n. Okay. And then we load n's into the context like this. So we need another predicate element, which is a predicate on natural numbers. Okay. Okay, so do you see how this program works? <coughs> Does it make sense here? So I call load as a goal, um, and it will go over the list and put element of n into the context. So after I'm done with load, when I'm here at the very end, right, the context will consist of a whole bunch of things. Okay. So now the next problem I face is that now I want to run my forward chaining thing, right, my forward chaining algorithm, in order to find the maximum of all these, li of all these elements. Okay. So the problem is that if I return from load, okay, first of all, this wouldn't succeed here unless the list is empty, okay? Because the, all the elements have to have loaded into the context that can only succeed if there's nothing left, okay? Um, and the other problem is that if this actually returns and says true, um, I'm basically lo losing the context in which I have made these assumptions. Do you think we're doing backward chaining, backward chaining, backward chaining? Now we're somewhere where we have the context where we want it, we can't return at that point because if we return, we'll come back to the point where the context is empty as we started. So we, we need to do, when we come to load of nil, that's when we actually need to start our forward chaining. Okay. So one, the list is empty. Okay. Then we have to start our forward chaining. Okay. So to start forward chaining, what do we do? Monad braces. Okay. Okay. So all the computation has to happen now here, while we're here, okay? And the problem is now, this is supposed to return a result, namely the maximum of everything. So we now need to return the maximum from this computation, okay? Okay, so what we need to do is we actually need to take the load predicate and we need to give it another argument, which is the final result, okay? Oops. Um, and that final result doesn't change. It's called the maximum. And we just pass that through. Oops. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. So this thing here now, okay, what we put inside the monad braces, that's the stuff that executed after the forward chaining has reached quiescence. And that has to read off the maximal element. Okay? And so how do we actually do this? So the way we actually do this is that Rather than thinking this is the max of x0 and x2, um, what we do is we start with element of x sub i, um, and we convert that into my current maximum is x sub i. Okay, so as far as that element knows, it, it is the maximum, so the current maximum x sub i. And now that happens for some other element as well. Element xj also gets current maximum x sub j, okay. And then we have a way, if two, two, two um, predicates claim that they're the current maximum, okay, you can actually go and generate new maximum here. And that would be either one of those. It would be xk, and k would be i or j, right? Okay? And in the process, we're consuming these two and we're asserting that, right? And that's exactly the kind of step that we're doing when we go down here. Um, and hopefully, if you can do this for the whole tree, if this can fire sort of arbitrarily, eventually we're left just with the one current maximum, okay? And that's the one that we can read off from the context. Why do you have to distinguish element yeah. and current max? Okay. So you don't want to distinguish element and current max, okay? So then what we do is the only element that's left would be our current maximum, like this, okay? Okay, so now what would be our forward chaining rule? If you do it that way, then n is what you return to max. Oh, yep. The only, uh, the only element is left is max. Okay. 
So how do we actually do this computation and how do we forward chain? Any ideas? Hmm? Yeah, so element of um, what M and element of N and L E Q M N. Okay, then. Element n, n the, um, the maximum, the, the greater one of the two. Okay, we have to name that. Um, let's say combine. Uh, okay. Um, okay, are we doing okay? Does that all make sense? Um, okay. So now this rule, when will this kind of rule, when will it reach quiescence, the forward chaining phase? It's just right, if there's just one element left, right? as long as there are two, you can always compare them. One is going to be less or equal to the other, maybe both directions. If they're equal, then it doesn't matter which way you fire. But it's actually okay not to matter because we have committed choice in the forward chaining phase. So if the rule can fire, we never look back. Um, and so in the end, there will only be one element left, and that will be the maximum that we can read that off of our linear context. OK. So that's low, that's hmm? plus minus. Yeah, we need to mode it. Very good. OK. So um, OK. So OK, let's do the, the, the mode for for load first. What is the mode for load? Um, it takes the list as an input and the maximum in the output, right? Okay. What is the mode of element? Minus. Okay. So the idea is minus. Because when we call element here, okay, when we call it as a goal in order to, to do a forward chaining, okay, we're not giving m as an input, m is unknown. m is an output of this call here. So m has to be an output. So therefore, element has to be minus. So what happens in forward chaining when all your clauses that are in your context are ground, that means that you can ask, you, know, you can actually examine these things. Everything will be output. So typically in a forward chaining program, there is no input, everything's output. Okay. So element, the mode of element will be output. Okay. It's um okay, so that means that after this matching, because element guarantees to output, this thing will be ground, this thing will be ground. Now it'll be called call less or equal on two things which are known, okay, to a ground. That's the way we defined it. And then we assert something new, but this thing is ground because it was ground over here. So we're okay there. Um, we have to worry about if this is okay, are we asserting something that is ground in this position? Okay. Well, this is an input, and so n will be ground, and so we can assert it, and it's negative. It works out because it's already ground. Um, in the recursive call, ns is ground, so this is known, so this is okay. Max is an output here, so that out generates it over here if the recursive call succeeds. Um, and Element here is, is um, a goal, a subgoal, eventually. So this will be ground because it's negative. And so he, this returns here, so that negative has been fulfilled. OK, so I believe this should be a correct program. So we should test it. Yeah? So you said that in the low cons. Uh, yeah. Like, so in the cons, n and n is ground, right? This is an input, so both of these things are known. Yeah. That's right. And we're assuming we're putting it into the context. But we know it's the same one. Hmm? But we know it's the same N. Oh, it's the same one. Okay, so the way that the backward chaining works, we match this against our goal. And since our goal is ground in here, we know N will be ground. And because this is quantified once with one N, this will be the N that you get from here. 
You can't make up a new variable here. Yeah. No, not output position. It's we put something into the context. Okay. We're not actually returning anything. We put something into the context as a new fact. And that fact, because it has to be an output in that one position, has to be ground. Okay. Okay. Okay, so let's let's do it more concretely here. Okay, so we're the, the query might be um, that we're solving is load of um, epsilon, which is a ground thing. Okay, um, and what's the output there? Well, the output is a variable max. We don't know what that is. Okay, so this is okay because this is input. We know this will be ground. Okay. Okay, so what happens now? Our sub goal from this will be that something that looks element. Epsilon implies um, what is the recursive call? Um, let's see. Uh, I should have written cons of epsilon and nil, and I should have changed my preferences. Okay. Um, sorry, cons epsilon nil, and the recursive call should be load nil max. OK, so that at this point, this will be our query, right? So now we put element e into the context. We're not outputting anything. We put it into the context. And now our goal will be load nil max. OK, so nothing returned yet. So this is kind of like a program clause. It's something that you can ask and query. And whatever you put here, by saying it's negative, whenever we ask it, it must ground its second argument in the query. So we'll, we'll ask somewhere to, some later element of x, or what did we call it? Element of n. We'll ask somewhere as a query below element of n, where n is an unknown. Okay? We have assumed element of epsilon. Okay? And so this will ground this n. So n is allowed as an output because this is known ground at the time that I make the assumption. Okay. No, but this is no, but even in twelve, because this is on the left hand side, just an assumption that you make, it needs to be ground if you want it to be an output. Okay. So it's the same as in twelve actually. But what does it even have to have a mode? Hmm? Well, yeah, because when you do this, you need to know that when you call less or equal, both things are ground, that you need you need to know that this M is known to be ground and this is known. So you need to, it needs to have a mode so that this less or equal is okay. You okay now? Are we okay? Um, okay, so we should test this. Um, okay. Generally, I seem to have good luck with saying star one, star one, even though I never remember what it is. Okay. Um, okay. And then um, we should check load off. Cons, um, let's see. So the first thing, let's just make this epsilon, which I call, what did I call that, E? Um, the second one should be, let's say, 3. So that would be a digit, 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 epsilon, bit 1, and bit 1. So I have 1 d too many. Unfortunately, the numbers are a little bit tedious to work with. Okay. And then the last thing will be, say, the number 2. So we say d of d of e and b1 and b0. And eventually we have nil. Okay. And we want the maximum to be output to the end. OK. So if I remember this correctly, this says um, this is a bound on how, far, how much forward chaining to do. 
but since we always should we should always terminate in the forward chaining phase as we reason because we remove one element at a time this shouldn't be a problem one says we expect a unique solution okay um, star says um, something else and one says run the query once okay so that's what we should get okay um, Okay, undeclared identifier minus. Oh. Uh. Do we have anything else? Probably we need to give mode. Do we need to give modes to other things? Is there anything else here? No, just those two predicates. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. Um, so what was the max? Three, right? Okay. Um, okay, so let's look at what the, what the dependency graph of this particular computation is. Um, so we had... Um, Yeah, that's true. Okay, let's look at it anyway. <laughs> okay, so what was X1? Okay, so it does a load of a cons, and so this X1 here should be the assumption element of X1. And anybody remember what the element X1 actually was? Um, I should, should be able to see it here. That's zero, right? Okay. Um, then the element X2, what is that? Um, that is this number three. So x2 should be the assumption element of um, x2. And then x3 should be two, if I did this right. So that x3 should be two. And then we have load nil, which basically means we have loaded the list. So you can see now we have in the context where if you go through the term, we have three assumptions, x1, x2, and x3. And because they're just lambdas, it means they're linear assumptions. OK, so now we go into the monad. So the rest of the computation takes place inside the monad, okay? Um, and it finishes like here. The monad finishes here, and these are the parentheses for these lambdas. Okay, so now we can combine of x1 and x3. Um, and the reason we can combine, which is um, here the proof that m is less or equal to n. Oh. Okay is the, here is the proof that x1, which is 0, is less than less or equal to 2, right? Because it's x3. So what we did is we combined these two here, and we have um, the number 2 here. And, oops, the number 2 here. And what was the name of that new number? X4. X4. Okay, so... And as part of that, we, we uh, consume this, and we can consume that. OK, so now we just have x4. And the next thing is combining with x2. And for that, we need a proof that um, 2 is less or equal to 3, right? And so that proof 2 is less or equal to 3 is this thing here, OK? Um, and so these two together. Oh, sorry. This and this gives us x5. And x5 should be 3, because um, 2 is less or equal to 3. And then x5 is what we return. Okay. So we have x5 here. Okay. So all the assumptions are being, being consumed. And the maximum is indeed 3. Okay. So this gives you kind of a dependency graph on which in the computation can influence which other thing. We don't get a lot of parallelism in this case, but you can imagine that if you have this larger that you get parallelism. And how is this manifest here? The way it's manifest here is that different rules of inference can permute with each other. Okay. So here, the, these two rules, we cannot permute the order of these two rules because this one introduces x4, and x4 is being used here. Okay. So maybe if we have a larger example, 
we could see some things that can be done in parallel. Maybe not. That's a matter of the luck of the draw. Um, so we say cons. Put another zero in there. Okay, so now there's a potential for parallelism. Okay, so let's check. x1 and x3 gives x5. x2 and x4 gets x6. So we were lucky. Okay, these two things um, can be permuted and could have been done in the opposite order, so they're independent. Um, and then we take the maximum of x5 and x6, which would return us x7. Okay, um, and the answer, fortunately, is still three, so I still get the right answer. So I think our program works. Okay. Um, okay. So I just. Okay. Um, let's see. What else could we do? Um, uh, let's see. Um, Okay, we could try the ordered framework and then see if we can translate into this um, a, a sort, sorting, okay, a list. Okay. So the way it's different, sorting a list, is that you have to load the context, you have to do some stuff, then you have to read it out. Okay. In this case, we only read out the maximal element, so the reading out is quite easy, right, because we just um, look it up. We don't have to iterate to read everything out. Um, so maybe before we do sorting, maybe we should do... Um, a permutation, okay. So I want a predicate that, that that generates an arbitrary permutation of a given input. So I have um, a permute which takes a list as an input um, and gives me a permuted list as an output, and it's a type family. So the mode of perm is input output, okay. So, um, so we're going to proceed in two phases as before. The first phase is reload things. Okay, so um, perm load um, cons. If we oops, to permute the list cons n followed by n's, we get the permuted list uh, k's um, if we add element n, and then we permute n's to give us k's. Okay, so how do we proceed when we have reached nil on the input list? Okay, um, do we need to forward chain for this? We can, okay. Uh, so let's try that. So we have perm nil, k's. So we have to start forward chaining, okay. And how do we do that? Okay, we need a predicate here. Well, how, do, how, do, how do we work? Maybe before we read off the answer, what is the forward chaining step? If you have an element and you have a list with this predicate, the predicate with the cons of that element. Okay, um, so if, I, if I've collected a list of k's, then I can collect cons of n and k's, something like this? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we need another predicate collect. What is its type? And was its mode? Right, it's part of the forward chaining, so it has to be ground. Okay, 
Um, okay, so we need to see this before we can actually go into backward chaining, right? We're saying we have collected so far nothing, and now we're running all the forward chaining, and at the end we should have collective Ks, right? Does that make sense? And so we've, we say so far we have nothing collected, then we run this in the forward chaining direction as much as we can. This will stop if there's no longer any elements, okay? Um, and then we try to solve the sub goal, but that'll just read off what we have collected so far, and then return it here, okay? So if we're okay on this, then I should change my query. Oh, and both of these, right? Yeah. Oops. Um. Okay, so I'd better not say, well, the question is, should we get a unique answer, I guess? The question is this number, do we expect one answer out of this? Um, well, so we remember that when we, ch when we count the number of answers, we're talking about backtracking in backward chaining. But in backward chaining, in fact, things are unique. So the non-determinism here is in the forward chaining phase, okay? But in the forward chaining phase, we have committed choice, so yes. Because of committed choice, there should be one answer, right? Um, okay. Let's see if there is. Okay. Um, okay, there is, but somehow we lost stuff, didn't we? Yeah. Um, the list is three. That's, that's, that's scary. What do we do? Anybody see the bug? Because I don't right now. I'm just see a strange answer. Okay, so what does it actually do? Let's look at the proof term. Why are we calling combine? Are we calling combine? Oh, yes, okay. So the problem is that we're using the same predicate element that we used before. And so the previous rules still fire, right? And they remove all the elements except the maximum one. Okay. 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 And eventually it actually collects it. I don't know why, but okay. All right, so we better uh, make a new predicate here. Um, okay. Okay, nodes I've already used. Uh, so what else could it be? Uh, okay, or member. It is an output. So here, take the members of the list. And here, be better. Okay, that looks like a better list. So we call collect four times. 
what do we get? 0, 2, 3, right? 0, 0, 2, 3. So one thing we can do is we can run it multiple times and see if the answer is always the same. Shouldn't be. Um, so the way we would do that is uh, we say um, run it like four times. Okay. So here we have three zero zero two. We have three zero two zero, and so on. So we get permutations, and um, all the permutations should be possible. Okay. Um, okay. So in order to do sorting, if we had um, an ordered context, okay, if we were in ordered logic, it would be very easy to do. Right, so how would you do it in if you had an ordered context? A very simple sorting algorithm, of course, like parallel bubble sort, if such a thing exists. Does it exist? Yes, because you can bubble in different areas. Yeah, yeah, there's still parallelism there, even though probably not generally what you think of as an efficient algorithm for parallel sorting. I actually don't know, but okay. So what we would do is we would, lead, we would um, take the elements and we would load them into the context. Element x1, element xn, okay? So they would be there and they would be ordered. So this would be our context omega. And now we could have a rule that says something like, if you have an element n, and next to it, the element, or let's call this M, element N. And um, let's see, N is less than M. And then we swap them, and we say element N followed by element M. OK? I think we only need that one rule, right? The rest is just building up the context and then reading it out again at the end. Okay, so as long as the list is sorted, if there's no two consecutive elements, such that the thing on the right is greater, is less than the thing on the left. Right? And so as long as the list is not sorted, rule can fire, and it gets rid of one sort of incorrect pair. So eventually this has to terminate and the list has to be sorted. Okay, so the problem is we cannot implement this directly because unfortunately, um, in CLF, we don't have the ordered context. Okay. Um, so can we still implement that, that, that idea? How do you reform the list once that rule stops applying? Ah, okay. So let's say the context is now like this, and we're actually done and it's ordered. How would we reform the list? Uh, yeah? Hmm? Okay, you're answering my question from before, right? So in the ordered case, you know, how would you reconstitute? Okay. Yeah? Could we put a marker on and then check uh, if we have something next to that marker, then we build it in and shove the marker down? Right. So we have something like the front of the element here, like front would be here, right? And then the, the rule would be if we have front and next to it we have... Um, uh, uh, actually, do we need that? Maybe we don't need that because now I'm thinking that um, when we do our recursive call, oh, sorry, this would be one of these things. I would say we put collect nil and we use the left implication, okay? And then we're trying to prove, um, you know, whatever we have to do. And so what this will do with the collect nil uh, will be put at the left end of the context, okay? And then I think we can just uh, consume the elements one by one, even though maybe it's better to start from the back. Yeah, maybe it's better to start from the back, make this a right implication. So we put the collect over here, and then the rule would say if we have an element n, and to the right of it we have a col collected already k's, then we would get to collect uh, cons 
of n with k's. How do you avoid doing that before it's sorted? Oh, you would do that when you have reach quiescence, right? So that this rule cannot fire anymore. Okay. So it cannot be done in the middle. Um, so I think by using right implication there, it will actually put it, it will have to put it at the right end of the context, not somewhere in the middle. And then it, it collects everything in order. Or we could use the marker to begin with. Um, but I think this is actually a cleaner solution. Um, so Favonia already answered the other question, how would we encode this here? And maybe actually I won't um, actually go through it. Um, but the way you do it is that you use the same thing that we did when we had destination passing style. Okay. Um, so what you do instead of having element, you have uh, element and it has a, a destination on the left and a destination on the right. And you have the element in the middle. Okay. And so then the next thing is element of d2, x2, d3. And the next thing is element d3, x3, d4, and so on. Okay. So that you have a, an order, but you have it encoded essentially by explicit pointers that tell you how to get back and forth. Um, between these things. Um, okay, maybe it does shouldn't take that long. Maybe we can write it. Um, and then the sorting algorithm hopefully will have quite a bit of parallelism in it because um, that rule there about it, it exchanging two consecutive elements, it should be able to fire independently on all the elements of the list. Okay, so we need a uh, a sort predicate, which takes a list and a list and gives us a type. So sort slash const, that's supposed to be loading it. Um, oh, well, we need a type of destinations. Okay. So let's call it LD. It takes a destination and another destination. And the idea is that the mode for load is we, we get a destination, we get a list, we get the other destination, um, and at the end we return the, the sorted list. Okay, so the, if we have the far left side, is, we call that D0, and we have a cons of um, n followed by more n's, and we have a current D, okay. Um, so we need to make, we need to load the context so we want um, the next element to go from D to some new destination. So how do we create a new destination? Okay, in forward chaining it exists, and backward chaining it's for all. Okay. So remember that the thing to the right of this arrow here, this stuff here, will be solved as a goal on the right-hand side. If there's a universal quantifier, it introduces a new parameter. So we say, okay, pi x, which is a destination. Uh, sorry, sorry, let's call it d prime. Then we make the assumption. Uh, we need to make an assumption. Um, let's see, we haven't used mem yet, which takes a destination and a natural number and another destination, and the whole thing is a predicate. So we say from d n to d prime, and then we, I should call this LD, and then we load from d prime, uh, and still from the initial thing, d0, to d prime, uh, ends d prime, except lowercase. Okay, and then sort slash actually LD. Okay. Uh, right. The K's are my result list. And if I reach nil, um, okay, so now at this point the invariant is that at the very end, left end of my list, I have D0. Okay, that's the beginning of it. 
And at the very end, the pointer at the very end here should be the D prime, unless I made some mistake. No, it should be the thing which is the end of the last one, which is this one here, right? So my list now goes from D0 to, to this D. Let me call it D end or D n or something like this. OK? Um, OK, so now we should start the forward chaining. And um, at the end, we should co call collect. Um, um, let's see, is there anything we haven't used yet? Collect k's from the context. And we have to be careful that we give it the right arguments. So presumably, we need to give it some where to start and maybe also where to end. I'm not sure. OK. So what is our one rule that we have? The swap rule. How does it, what does it look like? So we have a member D, D1 and D2, and member D2 and D3, and less than N of M. OK, now we have to swap these two things. Um, so I Probably this makes sense to say d1 and d2, and next to it d2 m d3, like that. Does that make sense? OK. And now the rules for collect. Um, OK, so here pro uh, Okay. I don't understand the role of the D0. It just seems to be a constant that never is associated with anything in MEM. Uh, okay. So when you call this initially, this D0 and this, this D will be equal to the D0. Okay. Um, so that the very first element here, sh this should be d0. I don't know if that works, but it seems plausible. But now we have to, we have to write the rules for collection. Um, so how do we do this? Um, so if we, if we have an element, if we're supposed to collect, um, Okay. Any suggestions how to do this? I guess we should start at the right end, right? So that they're actually. Um, so that means if we collect d0, k is dn, and we have the element um, n, d1, n dn, then we collect d0 cons and k's uh, d1. Does that make sense? So we, we start at the end. Um, we already have a list. And we have to finish here. So if you find one that actually is at the end, and this would be dn minus 1. Um, Do we need to know where we'll finish? Because it's like, well, we just run out of nonsense. Right. Uh, we, we return when d0 and dn are the same? Right. So when we finish and we read it off, um, so we need to, so how do we do this, actually?
So at the beginning, we need to say we haven't collected anything yet, right? Um, yeah, but so collect D0 and then nil Dn, where Dn is where we start, and then what we want to get back is something where D0 and Dn are equal. Right. That would be the idea. Right. But I'm a little worried that if I, if I say collect d0 nil dn here, something like this, we want to collect the whole list. The, the thing I'm worried about is that we can start collecting before we're done swapping. Yeah. yeah. So maybe we should write collection as a backward chaining program. Right. So that the, the two things don't interfere. And then, then it should be easier. So to collect nil would be to collect um, d0 uh, nil d0 like this and collect cons and k's <coughs> if um, in the backward chaining sense. OK. Um, OK, so, so we want to, this thing here should be working forwards, right? So if we find the element at dn, then we remove it here, and we actually say, now the next thing is d1, so we still have to collect that. And we collect in the output, we add n to the output that we have so far. Um, no, that should be ks over there, right? When it's backward chaining, we need to do it like this. Um, and when we hit D0, then we know we've collected them all. There should be nil left. I think the, in the second rule of the echo chaining, yeah. yeah. the member, member in the memory should be like D, N, N, D1, not D1, N, D, N. <coughs> Here? So here, yeah, so we always look at the end first, right? Because we have to collect them from the end forward. OK. Let's put some modes on this. Um, so what's the mode of mem? Uh, it takes a destination. Oh, sorry. It's it's one of the things we load into memory, right? So it should be all ground. And we need checks destination and a list and a destination. And what should be the mode of that? Hmm? It's a backward chaining thing, right? So it takes two destinations as an input and collects the list in the middle, right? <coughs> and so now the top level sort takes two lists and how does it work? Well, it takes uh, uh, an input and generates an output. And what does it do? If you give it a list of ends, it should um, create a destination and call load with d0, the list of ends, and d0. Um, and the output k's. And that's our output here. Um, okay. 
Does that look all plausible somehow? Yeah? So, uh, what's, the, what's the difference between putting uh, the, the mona bracket in the dot new from putting the mona y in the end of the collect new? Uh, what is the difference between? Putting the, the mona bracket in the load yeah. Between uh, the, I mean, putting the one one in the end of the colon, you know, we don't have that. Uh, we don't have that currency, but I mean, that it seems that we can put uh, one one in the end of. So we could do this. You're saying we can do this in the forward chaining direction. No, I mean we could change the. Yeah. Okay, I don't think that works. Yeah. So here, what we need to do, when we enter these monad brackets, right, we do this forward chaining until we can't do it anymore. Then the list should be sorted. And now we have to collect it. And before we collect it with forward chaining, but there's a problem with that because um, this could, the, the forward chaining rules could interfere with the swapping rule. So we do this by backward chaining. Um, okay, I don't see any bugs here right now. If you. Yep. So, why do we actually need a Boolean list? Why is it only the same? Um, we have to add another premise, though, instead of the. Um, okay, so what we need to be able to do is we need to do this. So, we need to say that this points to this. Yeah, but then we can add another, another premise, right? This points to that, and that points to that, and that points to that. Um, I'm not sure how to do that, because. In, in, in essence, this is a singly linked list. This is a pointer to the next element, and this is the label where the element is stored. So think of this D2 as the address where this is, and D3 being the pointer to the next element, because we don't have numbers, they're not like storage numbers, right? So this is a destination that says, at location D1, there is a natural number and a pointer to the next element. So it really is a singly linked list. Yeah, okay, so it is. Yeah. It's not really doubly linked list. Yeah, I was yeah. wondering. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, that's yeah. Nice. okay. Okay. Uh, so we should be able to ask optimistically uh, to sort this list. Okay. And it does it four times. Did it sort it backwards? Oh, drat. Okay, but it sorted nevertheless, right? <laughs> okay. So if you want to sort it forward. <laughs> what here? Um, Say D zero, like this, D one, no. Really? How is that possible? I think that would be a, that would be a scary thing, but definitely, obviously, this is wrong somewhere. So, because what do we do? Um, yeah. Okay, so what do we what do we do here? How do we? How, what's the easiest way to fix this? 
So you do less than MN. Okay, minimum fix M N. Oops. Oh, it changed something back the wrong way. D1, right? Yeah. OK. OK, now is it in increasing order? Yes. 0, 0, 2, 3. OK. All right. Two mistakes that cancel each other, always the best kind of mistakes. OK. OK, but and anyway, looking at the code, though, um, oh, we should, be, we should look at whether there was any parallelism here. But these kind of algorithms, they have a very specific kind of flavor. Um, Namely, that there's a load phase and there's a read phase. And in between, you have the computation phase. Right? And the computation phase is what you want to get. That's where you get the parallelism, right? And so I think it's cool that you can do a sorting algorithm basically in one line, right, besides loading and reading. It's just this one line. And if it were ordered, in ordered logic, it would be even simpler, right, because we wouldn't need the destinations. This would be a fuse. Otherwise, the rule would be the same. Um, and it should have a lot of intrinsic parallelism because all these things just sit in the context and the role can fire arbitrarily. Um, and let's see if we actually got any parallelism. Um, OK, well, let's just see here. Um, no, we didn't, because th there's only like probably like one element that's out of order. And so it has to swap these two and then swap x6 with x3. So. Yeah. OK, our example was too small, but you can use your imagination. OK, okay. So, so we actually started studying this kind of parallelism as a thing in itself. Actually, one of the new homework assignments, which I'll, I'll, I write up um, probably tonight, um, asks you to explore that. So this kind of a graph is kind of a dependency graph. And there was a thesis by um, Dan Spoonhauer, who was a, was a PhD student here, in which he looked at these um, these kind of dependency graphs which arise in particular computation as, some, as a particular kind of cost semantics because it exhibits what kind of the computations could actually happen in parallel versus which kind of computation have to happen sequentially. Okay. Um, and uh, so we actually changed our view on the, on the proof term assignment a little bit in order to give this a kind of a more first class status. Okay. And so the way we did that, um, is that in the crucial rule when you, um, okay, so um, at some point you have to decide you work on the right hand side. And so there's a rule where you go from S lax to being focused on um, S is on in focus on the right. And you remember the term M here, okay was a monadic term, which is something like, because S is the positive ones, it's like a tensor and so on, which match the patterns that we had before. Um, so instead of saying that um, when we do this, we essentially just return the M here. Okay, so we change this rule, and we say that um, um, we have, this is a different use of the word epsilon than in the example. So what you want to do is you want to take the whole computation, all the sequence of steps that can be done, and isolate that as a new notion, which we call an epsilon. Okay. So what does a computation actually do? So if you think about this, if you just look at the linear part, um, a computation, um, a sequence of these steps, consumes part of the context delta and produces a new context delta prime. Okay, so you can think of this in this kind of dependency graph. It's some kind of slice through here. Okay. And at the interface there, if you think about the computation that happens above, um, you consume some of the assumptions, then you do some computation, and then you're in a new state. Okay. So previously we wrote something. We go from delta, we go to delta prime, right? And we didn't write any proof term for that because we weren't interested at that point in talking about um, the proof as terms, right? But if you want to see what does this computation look like, we could write it like this. Okay, the computation epsilon goes from delta to delta prime. In some sense, the type theoretically more traditional notation would be, you know, from delta, 
um, epsilon goes to delta prime in this kind of style. But these really mean the same thing. So it takes a transition where you ignore the right-hand side and gives you evidence for what actually happened in the computation. Um, and then you can take one of these computations and you can, you can uh, bind it here. And then the monadic term at the very end of the computation uh, will be in this context delta prime that this computation here generated. Okay. So what are the possible epsilons, just to be, um, and what are the typing rules for it? Okay, so the simplest one is if there's no step to be taken at all. So if forward chaining saturates be, or has quiescence because you can't take any steps. And that would look like this. Um, from delta, the empty computation would go to delta. Okay. So that's one possibility. Okay. Um, uh, another possibility is we compose two of these things. So from delta 1, if we take epsilon 1 and then we take epsilon 2, we can go to delta 3. If epsilon 1 takes us from delta 1 to delta 2, and epsilon 2 takes us from delta 2 to delta 3. Okay. So those are kind of the ways to build up more complicated ones from single steps. And a single step, if you look at the example, what is the single step in this? So a single step in these computation is one of these bindings. Okay. So it takes a pattern on the left-hand side and one of these kind of terms, which is turns out to be an R, okay, from the in terminology of last time, on the right-hand side. So um, we have to be able to type as a particular kind of epsilon in delta, a P equals R, and it has to yield us some delta prime on the right-hand side. Okay. So that's a single step of the computation, um, is one of these bindings, except that the way we write it is like this with the monad braces, because this R has to produce a monad expression. Okay. So this is, so you can think of this computation, which is just two steps here, as being kind of reconstituted in such a way that we have a monad brace, and then we have one let, and then a sequence of these bindings, which are separated by these semicolons. Okay. So how do we type that? Um, well, this means that we focus on something on the left-hand side. That's the computation R. So we actually need to take an x colon a and focus on that. Like this. OK. Um, and then when you come to the monad and you have evidence R that um, we have S in focus here, then um, the proof term will be P equals R and has matched delta prime. And how do we relate the P and the S to each other? So remember, in a forward chaining step, what this means is um, you assert the S's into the context. And this P here gives you the names, the, the labels, for the new things that S will put into the context. So what you do is we take delta and we add P colon S to our context. And um, okay, then what we get out of this has to be a delta prime. Okay. Um, so what does this P? So the R comes from here, and the pattern comes from here. And this thing now will decompose the S into the pieces. Okay. Um, so in the variables that I mentioned in this pattern, P, until all the inversion steps on the left have been done. And so there's a last rule that says from delta, we can transition to delta prime. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, so it's delta. And the requirement is that delta is stable. So no invertible rules can be applied. Okay. Okay. So basically what we're doing here is we're, we can write down an epsilon, which is either a zero step computation, a composition of two things, or it's one of these bindings. Okay. Um, and then you can talk about when things can be permuted, because they're really supposed to describe graphs. Okay. Graphs, dependency graphs about which depends on which other thing. Okay. And so um, 
the question is, how do we actually, when can we permute two things? Okay. So um, we need a little bit of notation for that. Okay. So um, this actually comes from, um, from some of concurrency theory work. Okay. So the, the variables that are used by one of these uh, P equals R assignments are the free variables in R. Okay. So in some sense, this just records which variables are used by R. And since we're in a linear, in, in, from, for a moment we're in the linear setting, it just says that's what this computation depends on. Okay. And this is written as a dot in front of the computation itself. Okay. And then we have something like this. P equals R with a post here. And those are the variables in, that are bound in the pattern P. So these are variables that are defined by that, okay, by this kind of a binding. And then how do you extend it to, to, to epsilons, okay, in general? So if you have a composition of two things, um, okay, what are the variables that are used by this? So it would be the variables that are used by E1, unions, the variables that are used by E2, okay, um, except for those that are generated by E1. So minus epsilon 1, like this, okay. So the variables that are actually used here, the thing that this depends on is either something in this epsilon 1 depends on that, or in epsilon 2, but you have to subtract out the ones that are generated in epsilon 1 because they're not an external dependency. Okay, and for the, the post set, um, let's see, it should be the post set, the things that epsilon 2 generates, union the things that epsilon 1 generates, except that you subtract out the one that are consumed by epsilon 2, because they're not visible at the outside. Okay. Um, okay, what is the preset? of the empty computation. Well, it doesn't depend on anything, right? So that should be the same as the post set of the empty computation. And that should just be the empty set, OK? And then we already defined it here. And now you have it for any um, computation. You have to find the variables that it depends on and the variable that it generates, OK? And so now. Um, we can say something like um, epsilon 1 followed by epsilon 2 is equal to epsilon 2 followed by epsilon 1. Okay. So we can swap the two computations. They're independent of, the, of each other. Okay. Under which conditions? So when can we swap two computations? Right. So if we take the post set and intersect that with the preset of E2, that's empty. And also? The other, two, the other way around, right? The post set of E2 intersect the preset of epsilon 1 is also empty. Okay. So we don't introduce any spurious dependency here, and we don't have any spurious dependency between these two here, right? And so now, if these two conditions are satisfied because these two are equal, then we can write it epsilon in parallel with epsilon 2. Okay. So what you get now is a notation for these things um, where, in the syntax, if you will, you can make explicit which things can be permuting with each other. So you get kind of a graph structure that captures exactly the dependencies in a particular computation of which things can happen in parallel and which things can happen, uh, must happen in sequence because there's a dependency of these things on each other. Okay. Um, and so one can do some more things. You can define like normal forms of these kind of computations um, and so on. And so this, in the more abstract setting, without these particular kind of steps, this has been investigated um, in various branches of concurrency theory. But here we're defining it out for a particular notion 
in which you can actually see is in the laws that we get here are the instance of the laws that are assumed. And I think it's related to something that's called tracelets, um, where you have sequential and uh, uh, parallel computations mixed. Um, okay, so, um, so we have to start thinking about these kind of things. And things are more complicated also because you have persistent assumptions rather than purely linear ones. Um, but I think one can do a, a fair amount of concurrency theory just reasoning about these, um, about these kind of artifacts, which are directly derived from what the type theory gives you. The only change in perspectives that we needed to make was to say that um, we'll change this rule so that all the computation that happens inside the monad is isolated into this, um, into this object that we can then talk about rather than having these nested lets, which are, we, we can't really manipulate as a, as a concurrent computation in and of itself. Um, okay, so I will put out an, uh, sort of um, an assignment about this. Um, but I really want to move on um, because um, there's a, a few more things that I really want to get to. So, um, so what I'll start talking about next, which I originally wanted to do today, but I, I thought that we hadn't really fully covered enough parallelism, is to talk about a resource semantics. So now we're starting to talk about the semantics of these um, in terms of explicitly tracking resources in the way that we write down the inference rules. So it gives us a different way to think about the linear logic than we have so far. Or at least the formal system looks very different even when we're trying to think about it essentially in the same way. So we'll, we'll do that next week. Um, okay, questions?